All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Project Vocal's fourth dialogue on the truth behind youth and climate advocacy. Today's dialogue is in conjunction with Earth Day, which happens on April 22nd, just two days ago. I hope you all had a good Earth Day celebration, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Today's program is fueled by the Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program, GEFSGP of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP and led by Econites. My name is Ashley and I'll be your host for today. I am the head of the Environmental Task Force at UNAM Youth and I am also a Project Vocal Ambassador. So before I introduce our speakers for today, I'd like to go through some general housekeeping rules. Today's session will be recorded and published on Project Vocal's website and social media. If participants do not want to be featured, you may turn off your cameras. I'd like to remind everyone to mute yourselves at all times so as to not disturb the ongoing discussion. And any questions that participants may have during the sessions are to be sent via the chat box and will be addressed during the Q&A session later. There will be a quick photography session before the program ends, so do not leave the room just yet. Everyone is welcome to participate and remember to turn on your camera. And finally, Everyone who participates in this dialogue will receive an e-certificate. All right, um, now that we're done with some general housekeeping rules, let me introduce you to our first speaker for today. First, we have Mr. Shaq Koyok here with us. Some of you might have known him already. Some of you might have already seen his art on display. Mr. Shaq Koyok is a contemporary artist and activist of the indigenous Tamoan tribe of Selangor. In his early years, a land developer encroached the jungle around his village, and now it reflects in many of his works. That trauma in his childhood has fueled his passion and led him to fight for his people's land rights. He loves to explore many mediums of art, from contemporary painting to installation art. All right, um, now maybe let's you know, put our virtual hands together, or you, know, you can click the reaction button and the clap reaction button and let's welcome Mr. Shaq Kayak. Yes, thank you. The floor is yours, Mr. Shaq. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here today. And I'm so glad to, to be together with other uh, youth leader and uh, so, uh, everybody who are joining uh, our discussion today. So, uh, so I share my screen. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Right, uh, I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, you know, acknowledge the, the all the uh, great, uh, great, um, uh, I uh, youth leader uh, around the world that really kicking this, uh, this um, youth uh, movement in climate change, and you know, and they they actually starting this uh, journey since early nineties, and then we we uh, we only in, in, in starting this uh, movement in, in 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 Asia, and then I'm I'm so glad that I uh, you know. Uh, we actually now together uh, in, in, in one page talking about the climate change and we actually uh, uh, try best how we can to, to make a change in what happened now and then try to reduce the uh, carbon footprint that we and release the our atmosphere. Right. Um, here I'd like to uh, tell, tell you guys a little bit about how I involved in climate change and how, how I started. It started uh, since uh, early in, uh, 2006. I went, uh, I think, uh, actually I was in the, in the university that time and uh, the, the land encroachment happened in my village. This, um, and, uh, and actually I produced this work based on that kind of experience. Uh, I, I, feel, I felt so helpless because I was in the university in Malacca, but the, the encroachment happened in my village. So, in that time, I really 
uh, felt that I, uh, you know, I feel so guilty that I can't uh, go back to my village, try to stop uh, the, the destruction happen. So in 2006, I keep talking about my problem a lot in my university, so end up in, in my artwork. So I starting this, um, basically try to campaign to, to give the, uh, the use about what happened in the in the indigenous community that uh, affected by this uh, overdevelopment projects, and then and then I joining uh, a workshop uh, how to mobilize the the movement and also how to uh, uh, organize the a protest or demonstration based on on what happened in in uh, indigenous community because. So many indigenous community will live nearby the forest. So, and how to empower the indigenous community, uh, how to uh, give them voice, give them, uh, you know, I mean, a space for them to, to talk about their problem in us. And also, of course, they're dealing with uh, uh, loss of resources, loss of uh, biodiversity. In their in their lane, in their uh, just back, back of their home. So um, uh, I managed. Uh, so in in during my university time, I saw uh, almost like every weekend. I'm uh, not not every weekend. I got once a month of of in the weekend. I will go to the workshop and 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 you know how to uh, to be a good uh, presenter, to be a good uh, you know. To, uh, to tell the story in, in my perspective and in, in my journey as an indigenous uh, person and also how to address the issue in public. So I, I also try to, uh, you know, be together with people that, that, that and community that have a safe space for for them to speak on 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 behalf of their community uh, talking about the, the loss of spirit jungle is our, you know Jungle is our history. Jungle indigenous people, we always uh, become of uh, one of, of frontliner in protecting the forest, not just for us, but actually for everybody uh, in Malaysia. You know, we're talking about global issue now. So by learning that 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 uh, kind of knowledge in the workshop, I try to best my best I can to transfer the knowledge to the community uh, uh, community by uh, telling them what I learned and, and, uh, and teach them the language they can speak. And, and, and I run so many uh, program in, in a village and I try to give them uh, some something back and give them some you know, strength to speak. So I uh, give it a, a, and I also using my art as, as my tool to, to, to empower them. So for me, uh, as a artist, as I think it's now is uh, our duty. But I think it's, this part is similar to every young people around the world. And, and that actually give him a lot of uh, strength now. And when that, uh, uh, the forest, Behind my village, I've been attacked again in last year. Too. Uh, we actually uh, managed to get help so with uh, help from many NGO in Malaysia, and it's, I'm so glad that uh, uh, now we got the try to fight and try not to allow the. Uh, our Selangor government to destroy and 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 you know destroy the the forest near uh, near my village, which is uh, Kuala Lumpur North Forest Reserve. So I think this is like a moral calling for everybody, and 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 
And I think it's because most people, you know, for us, we are activists, I feel lucky that I can, I can, I can give up anything what I do to go to the street and to protest, to, to voice uh, uh, about indigenous right, about um, to voice about the climate issue in the street. But for those who, you know, who, who work, they, they, they can't strike, you know, they can't uh, uh, give up their, their daily job because they, 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 they will face some significant fear of the you know, economic and uh, political backlash. So I was lucky to be, do my work, but at the same time, I could just go to the street and it's quite privileged to have that kind of uh, opportunity. And that, that's actually uh, will affect some of the, uh, you know, indigenous people who actually have, have a really, uh, you know, proper job. And suddenly this thing happened, they actually cannot give up their life. But we managed to, to do that by, uh, you know, community engagement, community, uh, uh, you know, relationship between other villages. So we, we managed to stage this demonstration by, you know, and in this demonstration also happened last year. So we managed to send memorandum to the Salam government to, to stop the, 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 the idea of the gazette, the this forest reserve, you know, because this is violate any uh, constitution law, it violates uh, violate to any or any indigenous law, indigenous act. And um, because the way they did it is just, uh, improper and the way they did it is, is already, you know, uh, I would say it's uh, against any law. So, so, uh, so the Kuala Lumpur Forest Reserve is uh, uh, always back in my mind at the moment, and it always uh, become uh, part of my. Uh, development as uh, activists and artists, but also is is uh, is uh, actually world because Kuala Lumpur is very uh, very sensitive area of, uh, of forest because the forest is peat forest. Peat forest contain a lot of carbon. If you destroy it, we release a lot of. I think I think it's about five uh, five million ton of carbon. The store because peat forests are very good in absorbing our uh, carbon that we release in our atmosphere, and that which peat forests actually the the only part of ecosystem in the planet that we cannot even touch. Leave the peat forest alone. I think the peat forests do the do the job that we cannot do because peat forests will turn the carbon into oxygen that we need, and that's I think we everybody need to know. And we as a youth, we need to set up, you know, we need to set a good livable, livable future for our children. This is not fight for us. This is fight for our future. And I think, I think that says everything. And then, and uh, I hope I give another, uh, uh, I give another chance for other youth uh, leader out there to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your sharing, Mr. Shark. Yes, we must set a livable um, future for our children. Yes, next we have Ms. Shakila Zen from Kuasa, Persatuan Activist Sahabat Alam. She has been an activist for Kuasa since 2016, and in 2019, she was appointed as their media officer. She is also one of the active participants and trainer for Latihan Activist Alam Sakita Lasak from 2016 to 2019. Recently, WWF Malaysia has also appointed her as one of their Tiger Heroes for the Malayan Tiger Project campaign. She has joined Kuasa now for three years, and throughout the years, she has been actively involved in several cases involving Orang Asli and the environment. Ms. Shakila, let's hear from you now. All right, thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. And hi, thank you for Econite and um, Project Vocal for inviting me. Uh, hi to all uh, youth leader on climate change. My name is Shakila Zain. I'm from Persatuan Activist Sahabat Alam. I did prepare some uh, presentation, but I guess 
um, I can share it. Yeah, I can share it. So basically, I'm from Kuasa. Uh, if you not um, not familiar with with Kuasa, we are called uh, as or you can um, uh, we are actually a part of Sahabat Alam Malaysia. We are just like their their sons or their daughter from um, Sahabat Alam Malaysia. So. Uh, so if, if we translate Sahabat Alam Malaysia is about uh, friends of the earth, Malaysia. So we are like their, their child from Sahabat Alam Malaysia. So I've been involved with Kuasa since 2016. And interestingly, uh, my first involvement is actually from, um, from something uh, happened at Gua Musang at Kelantan, which is uh, I heard about it every year. I heard about uh, the the, the battle uh, between Orang Asli with a state government, uh, uh, Kelantan state government every year. Like I, since I was in secondary school, I think. So when I, uh, um, I'm in, in university, I still heard about it. And a lot of things, I, I do some research, I, I do read about, about these cases and everything. And even I, I, I read about um, some newspaper from, from that, um, that particular uh, political uh, party there, which is Harakah Daily and everything. I did read everything about it. And every time I read about these cases, uh, at Buen Musang and Orang Asli cases, they will say this is like fitnah, this is like uh, slander. They just want to, um, to, uh, to, to talk back, uh, to, to talk bad about, about um, Kelantan government. So when I made something, one posting at uh, Facebook, which is uh, from Persatuan Activist Sabah Alam of Kuasa, they did uh, help one, uh, one, what we call it LASA, which is Latihan Activist Sahab, uh, Alam Sekitar, which we, we call it as uh, one, we, they, they, they did some, um, one activity to uh, invite or to train a new activists so that we know about uh, what happened to, to our environment and what happened exactly on Malaysia. So I went there just to prove them wrong. I, I went there just to prove them wrong that the Kelantan, the, the Gumusan cases are something like very, uh, I mean, like it's a very, um, what we call it, a bad, a bad move from, from others just to, to um, to, to look back at Kelantan, uh, Kelantan government. So I went to Lhasa, the first Lhasa at, um, at Cameron Highland. And we went to Cameron Highland uh, through lodging, lodging which is uh, around Kelantan. So I can see everything around Kelantan or lodging is gone, which is they don't have any plants, they don't have anything. They're just like Mars. Everything is like uh, red, like, yeah, it's, it's mighty and everything. And sadly, the first day I came to Cameron Highland, it's actually raining, raining heavily, and it's actually flooding. So my first uh, impression is that, yeah, it's actually happening. What did I do uh, all these years? What did I do? Yeah, even I'm, uh, I went to university and all, I didn't get, get this information. I didn't get that the, the real situation about these, these cases, about, this, uh, about environment in Malaysia. So when I went to Lhasa, which is uh, the first one, the first thing I thought in my mind is that is it true or is it just something like pro, uh, just propaganda from from uh, naturalist something or from green movement? So I went uh, for Lhasa about four days at uh, at Cameron Highland, and we went to a lot of sites, which is uh, they have um, dam, a huge dam at at um, at um, I think around Cameron Highland, yes, Cameron Highland. And before they build that big dam, the, the mega dam, they have already um, uh, displaced the Orang Asli there. So it's like, this is the dam, and this is like Kampung Orang Asli. And they want the, the Tanah also, they want the land that uh, Orang Asli land also, they have to displace the Orang Asli. And they have uh, lost their, uh, their kampung, they have lost uh, their land, they have lost everything. So when I came to that, so I am a communication student and I, I learn about, uh, I learn about communication, I learn about um, uh, human, human communication and everything. And we went to, to uh, that orang asli, kampung orang asli, which has been displaced. 
So we talk about them, we we know or we care about what they they feel. So they said they they don't want uh, anything about it. So they don't even have the right or don't uh the, the government said this is for for kemajuan or like we call it like for pembangunan. So orang asli have to sacrifice a bit to 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 make some someone someone feel comfortable. But they uh, surprisingly, their kampung didn't even have electricity, which is uh, the government took their land, took their everything, but the orang asli itself didn't even get the electricity for their kampung. It's very irony. And the, the electricity is for like uh, for uh, people at town and everything. And orang asli didn't even get that uh, for their, sac they, they are sacrificing everything they have, but they don't give anything in return. So it's quite, uh, after I, I went back uh, from Lhasa, so I, I do some research, I do some readings and everything. And that's why the reason I still with Kwasa and now Lhasa is, um, we have like nice series of Lhasa and last week, last few weeks, we just went to um, Johor Bahru, and which is we go to uh, Fisherman uh, Village in Kuala Pi, eh, Tanjung Pi, sorry. Uh, the, went to a uh, fisherman uh, village at Kampung Telaga Aceh. Uh, we went to Orang Asli Settlement, which is Seleta, Seleta Orang Asli. And everyone, and everyone there is not satisfied with anything happen at Johor right now. We actually our mission is to Actually, what uh, we we have we want everyone, uh, not just you. We want every single person in Malaysia have the right to have the. Um, Ms. Shakila, uh, are you? I think you are kind of breaking. Um, sorry, Ms. Shakila, we can't really hear you. I think you're kind of breaking a bit over there. Um, sorry for the interruption. I think um, Ms. Shakila is gone for a while due to her internet connection problems. Um, but you can see that she was very passionate in what she does. Uh, for now, uh, let's move on to Ms. Alina, shall we? Um, finally, we have Ms. Alina from MGTC. Ms. Alina has had more than 15 years of experience in the green technology and the biotechnology industry. She is currently the Director for Business Development in the Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change, MGTC, executing company strategies aimed at inculcating green mindsets, 
development of green technologies for adaptation and deployment in spurring the green economy for Malaysia. She has also been involved in human capital development programs, which has produced over 600 participants from the existing workforce. So over to you, Ms. Elena. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, very good afternoon. I know it's Saturday, but uh, we've got a very interesting topic here that we have here today. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, send my thanks to the organizers, Eco Nights, uh, and of course the program uh, vocalists. Uh, as uh, Ash mentioned earlier, I've got 15 years of experience, so I'm not really a youth. <laughs> but I'm very flattered that, uh, you know, Vocalist and also Eco Nights has elected me to be one of the uh, Vocalist ambassadors. Uh, I'm not that senior, but at, at the same time, I'm also not that young. But maybe the earlier definition of youth in Malaysia, I might still qualify as a youth. Um, so, yeah, um, I've given my slides. Uh, if Sarah, you can project my slides. So I, I think uh, there's one non-Malaysian uh, in the audience. Uh, I, I will try to keep uh, the slides and my presentations all in English, uh, but uh, some of the words may be in Malay, so I'll just translate as best as I can. Um, so just wanted to highlight the first item today. Uh, so my topic will be problem statements of climate change in Malaysia and what are the mitigation strategies in combating climate change. Uh, so I'm from, my name is Elina from Green Tech Malaysia. Uh, and uh, we've also been rebranded uh, in uh, end of 2019 to become the Climate Change Centre. So we go to the next slide. So the next slide here shows what are the problem statements that we typically face when we talk about climate change. Uh, typical impacts, but in the Malaysian context, uh, sea level rise, reduced crop yields, greater diseases among forest species and also biodiversity loss. Uh, typically erosion of shorelines, increased flood intensities, coral reef bleaching. Uh, if you guys do snorkeling and scuba diving, you would be noticing this. Uh, it's becoming quite a, what do you call it, a regular phenomenon. If you go to uh, the West Coast, it's pretty bad already, Langkawi, Pulau Pangko. Uh, but if you go even to the East Coast of Malaysia, like Pulau Perhentian and Redang, you already see the picture on the bottom right there. So uh, increased incidences, incidences of diseases. So for the past 10 years, there's been more pandemics as compared to the last 50 years in the world. Uh, so this is something, it's a message that, you know, climate change is there. Uh, tidal inundation, decreased water availability, loss of biodiversity and droughts. But I just wanted to highlight the three, uh, even with the pandemic and even with whatever efforts that we're doing, uh, Port Klang might well be Atlantis in 2050. Uh, so for those of you who are staying near Port Klang, don't freak out yet. Uh, but this is a call to action that we need to do something. Uh, if not, your homes will be lost by 2050. Uh, luckily, uh, my hometown is Subang Jaya, but it will creep onwards inland, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, this is just taking picture from Temerloh, uh, the bottom, uh, sorry, the top right there, uh, flooding that happened in Temerloh, Kuantan was pretty bad. So we need to do something uh, in terms of reducing our carbon emissions. So we go to the next slide. Uh, so as you know, Malaysia is one of the 191 countries that is party to the Paris Agreement. Uh, uh, basically, the countries we do, uh, how it's different from the Kyoto Protocol previously is that uh, both in developing countries and developed countries, we come together and we pledge. Okay, so our country, Malaysia, what is our pledge at the Paris Agreement, which was signed in 2016? You go to the next slide. So the pledge from the um, uh, country, Malaysia, we're looking at 45% reduction in carbon emission intensity of GDP by 2030. So Malaysia and Singapore are the only two countries in ASEAN that actually pledge our country emission, uh, carbon emission reduction uh, intensity per GDP. The other countries in ASEAN, uh, they just pledge a, a carbon emission reduction. That's it. Uh, so our efforts and Singapore efforts is actually more because if you understand uh, economics, uh, when the GDP of the country goes up, carbon emissions also go up because we have industrialization, we've got commerce, we've got... Uh, perkilangan, factories and manufacturing and all that. So it, it also increases the carbon emissions. Lah. So what we need to do is GDP goes up, but we need to decouple the carbon emissions. Uh, so that's our mission. We go to the next slide. 
So what are the current policies that are in place, uh, uh, guiding policies that we have? We actually have a green technology policy, if you don't know, uh, that was launched in 2009. That same year, a climate change policy was also launched in 2009. Uh, but, you know, this policy is, you know, coming from uh, the younger generation, I presume, what does it mean, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's just like a nine to 40 pager document and then it's really very high level and very macro. So what we did was in 2017, uh, we launched the Green Technology Master Plan. So the Green Technology Master Plan, you can actually download at our website, mgtc.gov.my, or you can just Google uh, Green Technology Master Plan Malaysia 2017 to 2030. So you can actually download the document as a PDF and you can read through. So the Green Technology Master Plan actually is derived from the National Green Technology Policy, but we make it into specific action plans, specific sectoral targets. Uh, human beings, we need uh, a target. If we don't have a target, we will just be, you know, lulling around in clouds. So we need target. So that's why we set it. And then we focus on which are the sectors that emit the most carbon emission. Now. And then, of course, uh, 2019, there was the launch of Shack Prosperity Vision 2030. There's quite a number of chapter of youth also in that policy. So you can just read it through. Now. We go to the next slide. So uh, what is inside the Green Technology Master Plan, right? So I mentioned about the six sectors just now. We focus on the sectors of energy, building, transport, waste, water, and manufacturing. Why these six sectors? Because these six sectors, when we do baseline assessment for the country, uh, it emits the highest carbon emissions in Malaysia. But at the same time, these are the six sectors that has the most potential for green growth. Uh, because these are major sectors in Malaysia, although they are the biggest carbon emitters, but at the same time, there's a positive or a silver lining. They also have the highest potential for green investments. Uh, so that's why we focus on these six sectors. So energy sector, we look at the supply side uh, into renewable energy. On the demand side, we look at energy efficiency. Uh, you know, how are we going to be transitioning from coal and fossil fuel to this renewable energy? Uh, we look at public transportation, EV, energy efficient vehicles, uh, biofuel initiatives, waste recycling, water sector, and also in, uh, more industrial efficiency in our manufacturing sector. Uh, so we've got the mitigation strategies under the Green Technology Master Plan. But the adaptation strategies is there in the Dasar Perubahan Iklim Negara, the National Climate Change Center, eh, sorry, the National Climate Change Policy. So uh, what this means is that for youth, youth leaders that are here today, we've got uh, not that many participants, but hey, it's always good to actually get a voice out there. Uh, what are the areas that you can do? So if you are graduates in engineering, you could look into specializing in renewable energy. If you are, we are all using electricity at home. Can we be more energy efficient at home so that we can then at least contribute our uh, or at least not contribute to the carbon emissions. Lah. If you are, uh, you know, uh, buying products, why not buy green products? We've got a lot of green manufacturers in Malaysia. Uh, why not you look into buying green products or eco products? Uh, say, for example, we all use water. How can you be more water efficient in your daily uh, uses of water? Uh, when you take wudu, when you want to pray, when you wash your clothes in the washing machine, how can you be more water efficient? Uh, other than that, we, are, we all live in buildings. Uh, I don't think there's any homeless person here. Uh, so in a building, how can we be also efficient uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, our building footprint and our consumption? And whenever you consume anything, be make, sure, make sure you do recycling. Uh, so how does this policy translate to us? If you look deep down into the policies, is that how can you as a citizen of Malaysia, how can you as youth in Malaysia, you can actually influence your parents, you can influence communities, uh, you can influence your friends, you can influence you know, any pachi at the mama. Uh, so these are the kind of items that we need uh, youth leaders to actually step up. So we go to the next slide. So the next slide, uh, just a little bit of introduction. I know I'm not following the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, bullet points, but uh, basically I'm just jumping around. Uh, we are Green Tech Malaysia, Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change Center. We are a government agency and the Ministry of Environment and Water in Malaysia. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the Malaysian ministries, you can just Google, you know, list of cabinet ministries in Malaysia. I know the, the names have changed with the recent change of government, but it's good to know there's new ministries and there is a ministry 
that is looking at environment. So our mandate is that we are the lead agency uh, to champion green growth and climate change. Uh, so I do an open or welcome invitation, uh, but not in many people. Uh, uh, we have our picture of our building, our building there. Our building is in section 9, Bandar Baru Bangi. Uh, our building is the first green building in Malaysia. So we always welcome students, uh, youth to come to our office and then understand how uh, the green building in Malaysia, uh, you know, uh, started and then basically evolved from our building is an old building. Lah, so a lot more buildings have evolved from our building. Uh, so we go to the next slide. So, uh, uh, so this is our journey so far. We've been established as Green Tech Malaysia for the past 10 years. Before that, we were Pusat Tenaga Malaysia or Center of Energy Malaysia. Uh, we have actually a lot of impact that has happened in our country. So uh, for youth, uh, I know some youth are very vocal. Uh, some youth uh, you know, are, are activists, but uh, do your research before. Before you, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, say things about the government and all that. The government is doing a lot of things. It's just that maybe uh, we need your help uh, to implement our initiatives together. Uh, so basically, we financed uh, or helped with project financing in green investments. Over three hundred projects. Uh, we've got solar projects. We've got a lot of industrial projects on the ground. Uh, we've given the the next item there, Gita Gite. It's not a, you know, an African uh, acronym. Uh, it's actually Green Investment Tax Allowance and green income tax exemption. So we've given carrots, we've given incentives to business uh, businesses in Malaysia. Uh, when they do green, they get investment tax allowance. It's kind of, kind of like getting your income tax rebates uh, you know, when you're buying like uh, gadgets or sports equipment, right? So we need incentives. Uh, the GGP stands for Government Green Procurement. Our government has spent over 1 billion ringgit in buying green products. Uh, so this is something that you know, youth and activists, it would be good for you to know that the government is making the first move in Malaysia in going green. Uh, but uh, maybe you know, if any of you working in government as civil servants, uh, it will always be good to engage your procurement team as well in your ministry. Hey, are we buying green products uh, as a ministry? Or even in your company, if you're working out there in uh, the private sector, you can always check with your procurement as well. Uh, sustainable goal number 12, sustainable consumption and production. Producers need to produce uh, sustainable products and we consumers we need to uh, consume sustainable products so that's where you can contribute as part of the SDG. Uh, iGEM is our event um, I think in the panel discussion we'll be discussing on how uh, you know youth can get on board in, in times of pandemic iGEM will be a portal that you can get on board so it's a virtual exhibition we've changed to virtual with this pandemic uh, this is where you can get into dialogues you can get into conversations you can learn more about climate change from all the public listed companies state governments, federal government. Uh, it's a national exhibition as well as international. Uh, we have our Low Carbon Cities 2030 Challenge. That one is not a Marvel uh, logo there. It's our Low Carbon Cities 2030 Challenge. So the challenge uh, actually challenges cities to actually how can they reduce their carbon emissions? Because you know, by 2030, 70% of the population will be living in cities. So cities will be the biggest emitters in 10 years' time. So how can cities now can start on their low carbon initiative and then help us curb that uh, emissions by 2030? Uh, we've installed charging stations all over Malaysia. If you guys are petrol heads, uh, would be good to look into uh, energy efficient vehicles. We've got uh, units at Surya KLCC, we've got at Bangsa Shopping Centre, uh, we've got a lot. Uh, so you can actually have a look at our charging stations for electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, the yellow, uh, sorry, the green leaf at the bottom left there is our My Hijau. Uh, you can download the app on Google or App Store. You just search for My Hijau, M-Y-H-I-J-A-U. Or you can go to the website myhijau.my and then look at the green products that you can buy. Uh, so this one is a portal, a directory of green products uh, that you can be comforted and assured that those products have been certified as green. Other than that, if you guys are are interested in energy management, we do conduct energy management trainings. Uh, you will have an added value to your resume if you have this energy management training because there's a lot of need for energy management because a lot of organizations are going into energy efficiency. Uh, so also we've con we are conducting some sustainability and climate change uh, trainings as well, uh, starting from this year. Uh, so trainings is something that you can also get on board. Our energy management training you or can be from any background. You don't need to be from an engineering background. 
unless you want to be an energy auditor. But energy management, you can be from finance background, legal background, social background. You can join us uh, in the training. Uh, other than that, we've also done a lot of energy audits for hospitals and a lot of buildings in Malaysia. 2021 moving forward, what are our plans this year? We're looking at raising 7.8 billion ringgit in green investments, both the public sector and the private sector. Uh, we plan to reduce 24,000 uh, kiloton CO2 equivalent uh, in terms of carbon reduction and also creating green jobs. So for youth, green technology will be the sector to go to within the next 10 to 15 years uh, because there's a lot of need for talent there in that space. But at the same time, uh, it's sustainable. So uh, I call for you guys to join us in our Green Jobs mission. So we go to the next slide. Um, so the next slide looks at, um, you know, basically what our, our mandates and how we want to spearhead. Remember our national goal, 45% greenhouse gas emissions reduction. How do we do it? We do it via nurturing jobs, creation, investments. Uh, we also create a lot more green products and also uh, uh, looking at the contribution to our national GDP. Uh, the sectors that we look at, energy building, transport, waste, water, manufacturing. These are the stakeholders that we engage in Malaysia. The federal government, state government, local state authorities or our Majlis Perbandaran, communities, youths, civil society organizations, and of course the uh, industry players lah, that are in the sectors that we look into. Uh, and then we do provide advisory consultancy, financing and incentives, uh, investments as well, uh, low carbon solutions, uh, because we have a huge database on our technologies that are available, low uh, new energy and innovation, uh, training, capacity building, and also looking at certifications and recognitions, and awareness and promotion. We go to the next slide. Uh, I'm taking a little bit of time here, but I'm moving very fast. Uh, as I mentioned just now, the sustainable goal number 12, sustainable consumption and production through our My Hijau framework, the producers and manufacturers and service providers join as the producers. And then we as consumers, we can look at the database to buy. This is where the government ministries buy the green products. Uh, as and when they have a tender, oh, okay, I need a new company to clean my toilets in my ministry offices, look into the My Hijau uh, directory and then they can look for companies that actually do cleaning services using bio-based solutions rather than chemical detergents. Uh, that's just one example of how government ministries buy green products. Uh, and of course, public listed companies, they're starting to look into our My Hijau directory as well. We go to the next slide. Okay, so Low Carbon City 2030 Challenge. This is where you can be part of your residence association in your communities. Push them to push the budgets for Bandaran and local state authorities to join our Low Carbon Cities 2030 Challenge. So in the challenge, we are looking at two, establishing 200 low carbon zones by 2030 and 1,000 low carbon partners. What it means is that each Majlis Perbandaran or local state authority, they can decide what are the elements that they want to do to for having low carbon. They can look at urban transport that's low carbon. They can look at buildings that are low carbon. Uh, they can look at the infrastructure in the city that's low carbon. And they can even establish more parks and green environments. Uh, so these are the typical four elements in our Low Carbon Cities 2030 challenge. The challenge is pushing all 154 cities in Malaysia to go for low carbon. Uh, so this is where you at use, always keep a lookout, maybe there's some community announcements or your Majlis Perbandaran made some announcements for some initiatives, you can always join us. Okay, we go to the next slide. Okay, so I mentioned iGEM, right, just now. iGEM is uh, International Green Tech and Eco Products Exhibition Malaysia. It's been around for 11 years, if you're not aware. Uh, this year, we're doing it virtually for six months. So six months, you can always go into the website. It's via a website and looking at um, exhibitors that have green products. You can engage with them because they have like a talk to chat. Uh, that you can always engage with them via a chat message and all that. We've got tons of conferences. We've got uh, business matching if you're interested to be an entrepreneur in green technology sector. Uh, so we're starting on 1st of July. Uh, do register at uh, our website, which is igem.my. Okay, we go to the next slide. Okay, that's my last slide. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Alina. Uh, remember, you may not be a youth, but you're always young at heart. Anyway... <laughs> Thank you for your very inspiring and educational presentation. It's very good and very refreshing to know that our government is making steps to make Malaysia greener. Um, now, let's rewind a bit and let's go back and just uh, finish up Ms. Uh, Shakila's story. Yeah? Over to you, Ms. Shakila. Okay, thank you, Ashley. I'm so sorry for my connection. Um, okay, I think I just want to wrap up about our LASA. 
which is I encourage everyone to join us on Latihan Aktivis uh, Sahab, uh, Alam Sekitar, which is we uh, we have like a bunch of atau, or we have like um, a module for everyone to, to actually know about uh, what happening in Malaysia, what actually acts uh, or what laws can you uh, go against uh, everything that happened uh, in in our environment and, and everything. So we do some uh, three or four days um, uh, classes. Uh, we, we, we will bring you to the, um, uh, we, we call it as eco destruction, which is we show you the places where they have destruction. And we show you how, how, that, uh, how that destruction have impacted uh, grassroots community and everything. And we give you for 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 written. We give you what have uh, the the struggle of uh, grassroots community uh, facing and what they do along that uh, crisis. So you will learn and you will get uh, or you will bring back that knowledge to your own country or to your own um, states and everything. And you you uh, and what we want you to do is you you have to be a leader to your place. So that anything, um, whatever cases around around you, which is uh, you you for me, uh, is if from my story is I I I looked at Gua Musang story, which is it's not even in my country or not not even in my states. So uh, it, with Lhasa, we will um, I mean like we will train you to be a leader in your own uh, place, which is if you have uh, uh, for example in Hutan Simpan Kuala Langat Utara, they have deforestation so i want when you back go back to your your own uh, state or your own home you will find find that this is like what i should do to this and uh, you will um, use every everything or the knowledge we give you uh, through lasa to to do something to your community or to empower your community or to help your grassroots and everything so if you have the chance to to join us uh, with lasa so i think after raya in uh, July uh, or oh, sorry in uh, June I think we will go to uh, Kedah to look into the cases there which is I think is uh, is quite horrible there uh, with <laughs> with new MB and such so uh, if you want to join and want to uh, go with uh, grassroots and you want to know about their struggles as a grassroots and what impacted us uh, impacted them as a uh, Frontliners, I I must say that they are the frontliners of the climate, um, climate, um, I mean like climate change. So if you want to know uh, more about about their their ways, how to how to restore their uh, their fights and everything, you can join us uh, at Lasa Kedah on June, inshallah. Yeah, that's it for me. All right, thank you once again, Ms. Shakila. You really do have some um, interesting adventures indeed. So whoever's interested, you know who to look for. All right, now that the presentation part is over, it is time for our panel discussion. Today's topic is youth and climate advocacy, which is in conjunction with the Earth Day celebration. But the pandemic outbreak means our celebration has to be you know, a little different than usual. We're so grateful to have an amazing panel of speakers for today. So. Let's get the discussion going with a simple question. Um, so what does Earth Day mean to you? Um, would any of the panelists like to go first? Sorry, can you repeat the question? All right, what does Earth Day mean to you? Uh, for me, I think Earth Day is... Uh... For me, Earth Day is the every day. Just uh, we need to be aware that we actually live in Earth. That mm. we actually uh, need soil. We need actually need a plant to live together. Otherwise, without plant, without soil, without water, without air, we won't be here. We like it's like we are living in different planet like Mars. Nothing there. So, do you want our future would be like that, living like a, in in the in the planet of Mars or? Planet, are dependent without any atmosphere, no oxygen, nothing to eat, nothing to drink, you know, nothing, you know, nothing to breathe. So Earth Day is every day. It's our duty, it's our um, I think as our human duty to take care of this earth. I think 
every every step you take it will affect the future and we need to remember live uh based on what you need it's not what you want because that actually simple sustainable way you can do this i think everybody can do this because because you know by uh, not uh, you know uh, of course people have have the need to buy new car and new, new thing but you know you need to think twice before you make decision because every step you do like you know uh, driving a car in the street is a simple thing you're thinking if you drive a car probably putting another one car in the street and also you uh, you release so much of a carbon to a atmosphere you may think maybe you need to do uh, a car pulling with other uh, one of your colleagues together because you will reduce one of car for example and then you, you you spend less money of course and another thing you know we get so many things like uh, uh don't don't spend um so much time uh, with, with your aircon on in, in, in indoor and try the best you can to live simple, to live whatever you need because, you know, the less you, uh, uh, you know, uh, do, and, and, and I mean, the less you uh, release the company, I think it's a, uh, that's the way I think will help the, our future. I think that's that's for me, uh, Earth Day for me. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I definitely agree that Earth Day should be every day because Earth is, after all, our one and only home. Uh, Miss Alina and Miss Shakila, do you guys have anything to add? What does Earth Day mean to you? Yeah, I think for me, um, it's a bit bittersweet, lah, this Earth Day, you know, because uh, in my life experience, I've been through many <laughs> Earth Days already. When I was a youth, it was like, Kind of like a big deal, you know. So we go to like you know, uh, uh, Sydney Leisure, the curve and all that, right? Wow, I for some time lah. This one lah, this memories ah. So we go there and then like wow, Earth Day and then got cons. A negative impact um, but um, I think um, it's sweet so that's bitter in a sense like, because you know I when I was a youth I thought it was like a cool gimmick but then after that when I'm in the sector it actually didn't work like. but sweet in a sense that you know, uh, my daughter uh, in school, they, every Earth Day, they start to, uh, you know, uh, 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 the students are accountable for one plant. So they take care of the plant. So I think that uh, there's hope in our youth that, uh, you know, this Earth Day, they do good deeds during that day, but they also carry it forward to, uh, you know, taking care of the environment and all that. So I feel that, you know, uh, the more knowledge that we know, uh, the more that we can actually do to save our earth and our planet. Um, you know, regardless of any religion that we have in Malaysia, right? Earth is a borrowed uh, matter to us. It, it's, uh, you know, for those of you believe who believe in God, lah, you know, uh, it's, uh, what we call this, earth is just sementara. It's just given for you for a short while. And it's a gift from the creator. So, you know, how do you treat this gift is very important uh, because later you'll be judged based on how you treat the environment, right? So, um, yeah, take care of the earth, yeah. Mm, indeed, earth is our temporary home and we have to take care of it the best we can. Um, anything to add on, Ms. Shakila? All right, for me, I agree with two uh, panelists, Ms. Alina and Shak Koyo, which is, um, earth day is every day, which is, uh, but we, uh, with uh, in in Earth Day is actually uh it was um held Earth Day because they they have like one movement from NGO and others to to make everyone to participate on this uh, day which is we have to take care of our our Earth which is uh when first first year I joined with Quasa or in this movement green movement everyone said I am a communication student so why I I talk about uh, environment, why I always speak about environment, uh, why I, I so bothered about if I, about uh, engineers uh, person or orang asli or grassroots community, because I am like 
this is not even my my field field of study so everyone said uh you you should go to tv or be like um upper tv uh in tv and everything you you should speak about anything else beside of nature because you 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 studied uh, uh communication and everything so i said to them uh is it just uh environmental students that breathe the air we need today is it just environmental student that want to eat uh like foods uh foods from from our earth is it like just a uh, few people just need fish on the sea so i said i am uh, as a communication student i have the responsibility to teach everyone uh from uh outside that uh, environmental supplier to know about the what what we fight for and this is what uh, earth is for us this is like our sources for life we we get our protein from our sea we get our foods from uh, from plants and everything we get everything from from our earth so why why just environmental students or like people on environmental field have to take care of our earth why uh, how about doctors how about uh, students how about others we we still need this earth so for me this uh, earth day is um something like to trigger or to attract everyone to look at our our earth and think back is it uh, the this this uh, this fight is just for someone in environmental fire or is it for everyone because we need everything that everyone needs so this earth day for me is like one uh, just one uh, a day for a wake up call to actually uh, address our problems about the earth and about the system we we go through ar uh, around the world which is we can see this is happening all around the world just not just in malaysia so and sometimes the one who capable to destroy our land is not even in environmental field so why not we even not in environmental field also fire we have to fight back to to get what uh, we should get should have yeah that's it for me Mm, thank you, Ms. Shakila. All right, let's go on to the next question. So as you can see, the pandemic is a wake-up call for nature. All right, so I would like to know as a leader on the front lines of advocacy work, um, maybe could you share how youth can play a critical role to advocate and support and in conservation and sustainability initiatives? How can youth play a role, uh, particularly at this time? Any takers? Uh, yes, I think I think this is a duty for anybody who have uh, influence out there to you know give it. Um, of course, uh, we we have school itself. We we get a lot of teacher that have a great mind that that you know they, they teach important you know of course subject in the in the classes. But I think there's another uh, thing we as a as as uh, people that are uh, uh, out there, even to our children, even to our uh, young generation in the, in the home or something, just give it some, some something. You know, like, of course, if you're dealing with the with the teen teenager in the school, uh, they they also have uh, you know a, a urge to do a lot of things for 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 their own benefit, like something that, that, that every teenager love to do. But at the same time, we need to also remind them that they actually uh, can be a re, uh, responsible for, for, for the thing they do. Because, you know, for example, uh, you know, for me, I think it's, it's, it's my duty. For me, it's my duty to, 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 to share this spirit of uh, uh, fighting for our climate change and also uh, uh, giving a wake up call to anybody who, who never, uh, knew anything about the climate change, also hopefully I can I can make it be better for them and also make them to think twice before they do certain thing. You know, simple thing that you do like uh, going to you know everywhere. You know, and then you need to think twice also. You know, like I said, if you uh, actually this is, this is my always always in in my. In my um, Something that I learned from 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 being indigenous people in in my culture in my 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 hometown my my, my people we we as actually as a simple a simple lesson that I learned is, is every time we we take we need to give back for example 
And this is this is simple thing, like whatever we take, we make sure we don't take more than we need. And that's a simple, uh, sustainable uh, lesson that I, I learned. And I think this, I can apply that in, in my modern life now. I mean, I live in the city, yes, of course, but you know, I, I give, I'm so proud with myself because I've been, I only spend like a, a, for my for my electricity bill. So I only spend about 10 ringgit for my electricity bill. So about 10 ringgit in my water bill. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's something that I'm really proud of, you know. That's, <laughs> and, and, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I use a con, I use oven, I think, but in very uh, clever way. And you know? I really use uh, all these uh, 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 electric appliances for 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 right purpose. If you don't need, if you don't need it, you just turn it off. That's easy. And then I I actually time it. Time my my icon to a certain level. If I cool enough and I turn it off, I don't need every day. So that I will keep myself to pay almost like zero every <laughs> month. So <laughs> I think that's I think that's a simple thing. Everybody can do it, and I'm sure everybody can do it. Mm, very good point, Mr. Shaq. So I think we can all um, try to do that in our in our daily lives. Yeah, set your timer. <laughs> so. You need to think twice because everything has consequences in life and in the environment as well. Um, Miss Adina, Miss Shakira, would you, uh, any of you like to answer that question as well? Yeah, so I, I love that Sha Shaq is so consistent. <laughs> just, <laughs> just use what you need, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's a concept in Islam that also says the same thing. It's about wasatia. Uh, so you basically just, uh, you know, you just use and also consume uh, what you need. La. You don't need to be more than that. You know, the prophet uh, always stop eating before he becomes too full, right? But for Malaysians, we're like, you know, even if we are full, there's still space. <laughs> so uh, try to uh, have that concept la, generally. I think uh, to the question that was asked by uh, Ash, uh, you know, how can youth play a critical role to advocate and also support and fully engage? So I think... Um, for the youth, uh, the advantage is that youth, you have the agility, you have the flexibility, and you have the energy to actually continue this mission that we've already carried. Um, I think the sustainability journey in Malaysia started not as early as other countries. We started in the mid-2000s, uh, but uh, at least we've started as compared to other countries that may or may not have started. But, you know, there's another, we've only got about 40, 30 years left in our life expectancy <laughs> for the older generation. Uh, but this is where the youth, you need to carry on beyond 2050 uh, because our children and our grandchildren will still be on earth, uh, on in the planet at that point in time. Uh, so this is where your, uh, you know, energy and your passion uh, will definitely play because um, in the engagements that we have right now, young opinions do matter uh, because uh, you bring you guys bring a fresh perspective to something that may, you know, for us it's a same old same old situation. Uh, so that's why act, being active and engaging in communities in uh, with the initiatives by the government and everything else, the pub, the private sector with your company where you work with uh, is always important because um, you know every matter because we are all citizens of the planet yeah mm, definitely agility flexibility and energy remember use we all have this all right uh so for this COVID, like this pandemic we can't like easily go to other states and everything to uh to do uh, like normal advocacy, like from from Pasir, we usually go to grassroots community. We empower them. We teach them about new technology, about uh, movement. So what we do is we completed one of a book of Buku Panduan, uh, Pemantauan Hutan. This book is actually going through like three years of editing and fact checking and everything. And this year we can um, proudly to say we have like one buku panduan hutan to uh, this this buku we will give to um, grassroots community which uh, we go uh, and teach them and this this book uh, will will be given uh, free for the community so that they can uh, actually in this book is actually they have a lot of um, numbers or who you think uh, let me check first. 
they have something like uh, if you have anything uh, related to to hutan or uh, forest you can actually um uh, buat aduan to to the the right um badan and everything this this go through like three years of r and and we we just uh we just scared if i we we uh, we true or we we take something like uh, falsely. I mean, like uh, false news and everything. So we have taken three years to do this. And I think in this pandemic, we should uh, we 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 have to come up with something like a uh, physically like a book or something like uh, you can go with online classes and everything. But it's quite hard uh, because we work with a grassroots community, which is some places or some villages don't have um, I mean like uh, internet connection. So we have to uh, sometimes uh, call them and ask for them, is it okay if we come to your kampung? Is it have any uh, cases break out and everything? So what uh, youth can do is if you have any possibility or you have any chance to make any grassroots community, ask them, learn from them a lot. We, we can learn a lot from them, which is uh, from, fi from fishermen. You can learn a lot about uh, changing of uh, weather and everything. They can look at sky and they, they can say, oh, this is go going to rain heavily and everything. And I'm so impressed until now. And when you, uh, and actually when you go and seek for uh, indigenous people or orang asli, they, they, they saw like one poco and they can tell you, oh, this can do this, this can do that and everything. And they can even barefoot on the, on the forest. And this is like very amazing, amazing for me. So if you have chance to meet or to talk to indigenous people, to grassroots community, go engage with them. Go ask for them what they need. Uh, they, uh, they need do they need help or anything? Or sometimes uh, in Kwasa, we exchange like uh, knowledge. Like we, we, we learn from indigenous people about the, the forest uh, and the, uh, from fishermen, how to look at the weather and everything. And in return, we teach them how to use GPS, how to map their community, uh, the, the land and everything so that they have like proper copy or they have proper uh, thing to Uh, evocation, evocation, advocacy from uh, the grassroots itself, how they, how they uh, do some paperwork, how they fight uh, on court, how they still surviving for their lives and everything. So if you have any chance to meet any grassroots, please do so and engage with them. Yeah, that's it for me. Very interesting point, Shakila. Yes, indeed, we can learn from indigenous people, the fishermen, local community about the environment, because after all, they are the people who, who know most about it. And then when we teach them um, stuff about modern technology, you see, it's a win-win situation. All right, so uh, moving forward, my next question would be, how then can we spark interest in climate action among the youth? And how can we further guide them in this climate action sphere? What would your advice be for them? Miss Alina, would you like to take this question? Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, what do you call Uh, they, they want to know what is the purpose. I think that's the most important question to answer mm -hmm. and uh, this is actually the miscommunication that always happens between the senior generation and the younger generation. The younger generation keeps on asking why but the senior citizens are always like, you know, just, just do it. <laughs> I think they are stuck in the Nike <laughs> tagline for years. Uh, but I think um, 
uh, the purpose lah. I think the purpose is most important to actually spark interest. Uh, uh, I think the younger generations uh, in Malaysia right now, I think they are privileged in the sense that most of the younger generation they are educated, as compared to the older generation, the baby boomers. Um, you know, especially post-war, right? So they were not able to get education. Uh, and then maybe, maybe certain fragments of young youth in the, uh, what do you call it? The B40 lah, that may not have the education. But uh, with the youth that having the most education, uh, that purpose is important for us to communicate to them, to spark their interest. Uh, so when the purpose jives with their philosophies, jives with their principles, uh, jives with the greater good, I think it wouldn't be tough to actually get youths uh, to participate and join in initiatives. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question as now? Oh, yes, um, how can we further guide them in this climate action journey? Um, what advice would you have for them? Okay, so how to guide, right? So mm. uh, another miscommunication that happens is that the channels to communicate it's actually not the channels that the youth are always mm. engaged in. La. I <laughs> so definitely like, agree. Yeah. <laughs> so the channels that typically the older generation will use, like TV, surat kabar, newspaper, <laughs> right, where the youth totally don't buy all this anyway. Um, so I think the channels of communication is also very important, how to reach to the youth. La. Uh, so people are making a lot of effort. You see the government, they are putting up a lot more. Uh, so I think, um, you know, uh, it takes time, but I think... Uh, uh, the youth, how can they get on board is that they need to expose themselves to finding more information, more knowledge, uh, and then also exposure. Uh, the good thing about the generation now is that you have a lot of, you know, you have Saturday webinars that you can learn more about climate change, right? Honestly, for me, 10 to 15 years back, I don't have this at all. Uh, you know, you could access Elon Musk's speech on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, everything is at your fingertips. Uh, it's just that whether the willpower that you have to uh, access this information, learn about it, be passionate about it, and take one of it as your principle, your guiding tower, the thing that guides you every day. I think uh, that's the most important part where um, I think youth, they just need guidance, uh, you know, where to find the information, number one, and then after that, you know, uh, how can they get involved? Uh, remember, when we go to school, the teacher's role is actually to just fill this brain with information. Uh, it's actually the role of parents and our family and our exposure to the community that shapes our mindset. It's not the role of, but some teachers do extend that role uh, to shape our mindset. And they are the great teachers that every year you give the Happy Teachers Day card, right? Uh, but um, yeah, you, you have to understand uh, that uh, shaping mindset, you need to find people that can help you shape your mindset. You know, find mentors, learn from people, uh, you know, pick a good individual to actually be a role model and then build that uh, in yourself. Yeah. Hmm. Good advice, Ms. Alina. Um, Mr. Shah, yes, I see that you're ready to answer. <laughs> yes, I think um, how to attract the youth. Uh, and, and then the second one is uh, how to, what, what is it? The, the advice for them in their climate action journey. Okay, mm -hmm. right. I think, uh, I think we need to start uh, to put uh, the, the climate change as a part of the curriculum in the, in the, in the school. So I think that's the most important thing. So, and teach them from really young age because this is concerning to everybody. It's not just for Malaysia, around the world because we need to teach the young generation that climate change is real. We cannot just let them to be influenced by the wrong idea about climate change is not real because this is right in front of us. This is concern to everybody. Wherever they go out, when they feel hotter than where they used to be, then they know. This is, this is real. I think this must be in our education system. Climate change should be as a part of a, a core subject to any uh, uh, school out there. And that's, that's, I think, the first thing that they can learn. But now, I think, like, like uh, uh, I think now we are privileged with the information after information we consume every day in the social media. I think there's a role for our any influencer out there to influence the young generation about taking part of any program that we have, we, we provide in our, I was like every weekend now, we got a lot of uh, uh, climate uh, change kind of talk. And uh, you know, and also we can just eventually
crypto, I think make it even uh, easy access and uh, entertaining and make it even cooler. I think uh, to, to attack the global warming, make it cooler. You know? Yes, you can do like the global warming dance or something. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, I, I do remember that. Oh, remember remember the, 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 the campaign that uh, uh, the challenge that uh, clean the clean the street something people taking uh, before and after kind of picture. I think that's very clever challenge that everybody should take on. You know, you should you should do that again. You know, for example, that's a simple thing. Mm. Yes, very simple indeed. Um, due to time constraints, Ms. Shakila, uh, maybe you can answer briefly. Um, how can we spark interest in climate action and your advice for them in the climate action journey? All right, so I think to spark interest in youth is actually, uh, we live, I mean like youth live in um, what we call it, um, a, a, high fa a, a moving fast uh, social media life, which is uh, we keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So uh, if like one or two person uh, just talk about climate change, like a few other uh, fits is, is like uh, showing like they have cars, they have big, big house and everything it, they, their, their focus will be shifted to that i want i want uh, i want to have big cars i want to have a house like this and everything so if everyone and uh, each of us do the the campaign or we we put in our uh, our effort in our social media every time the youth scroll they will see oh this is happening this is the real cases just like me the first time i know about this climate change or even about uh crisis in malaysia is uh, on newspaper, but I can't get anything uh, right or pre precisely about that, that issues. So what, uh, what we should uh, advise uh, or how to advise uh, our youth leaders is always post about your, your movement, always post about everything you do so that uh, your, your clique or everyone, yeah, like your, um, your friends will, will look, look at it and start asking like, why did she post it? Why, what happening actually? So they will uh, eventually will read about it, will uh, look for more materials about it. So we'll buy something about it. And I think in Malaysia itself, we don't have enough platform or we from a local uh, author or local writer to write about uh, climate change or even about uh, environment, environmental crisis in Malaysia. But we can find it everywhere in Indonesia. We can find it everywhere in, uh, I mean, like uh, US and, and other countries, but not Malaysia. But, uh, and I think Malaysia should have that, um, that, that spirit because uh, in Malaysia, the majority is Muslim, which is uh, Islam Muslim. So in Al Quran, uh, 500 uh, verses about how to take care of our nature, of our world. But we don't have any books or we don't have any material to guide this, um, this young, young souls to, to do uh, better for, for, for this, this country. So for me, what we should do is if you are a pro professor or you, are, you have interest in writing, write about climate change. If you have interest in making videos, do a lot about climate change, do a lot of crisis in Malaysia. If you have like, uh, you have followers, you have TikTok or everything, try to uh, sometimes slit slit a few about uh, environment. So everyone will, will check like, oh, this is re really happening and everything. So for my advice is in a youth uh, advocacy in climate change is kind of hard. And sometimes it's, it can drain your energy, your physical, your mentally. It will drain everything out of you. So my advice is, I know this is like something very serious for our world, something serious for our country, but sometimes you have to breathe, you have to take care of your mental health. And sometimes, um, yeah, we, we can change, uh, I, we can change uh, something in one day or in a week or in a month. So this is a long process. So take it easy, breathe, uh, please uh, do engage with other people, with experienced people, with grassroots community. Uh, I think Miss Alina have a lot of experience. We can engage with her. Uh, Shak Koyo have experience in, in uh, nature and everything, engage with him. So uh, yeah, sometimes when we feel we, 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 we fight this battle alone, we will drain. 
like physically, mentally, we will do it. But when you get uh, alliances, you have uh, friends or you have something um, around you, you feel like this is not my, own, my only... very eager to to change the world to 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 make some uh, to slow the climate change and everything but take it easy breathe and this is like sometimes uh, you don't don't um don't sacrifice the solution we will find the solution uh then don't don't sacrifice your mental health yeah this is my advice for everyone all right, thank you so much to all three speakers for the very insightful sharing. Um, looks like we've got a few interesting questions. So um, we will now move on to the question and answer session. Um, due to time constraints, maybe we'll just have one panelist to answer one question each and maybe answer in short and concise sentences, yeah? <laughs> um, okay, the first question uh, will be, um, have we provided our people, all Malaysians, including indigenous, enough space and platform to get and spread environmental information in their own language? And what kind of effort can we do to make sure that English is not the only language used in conservation? Um, Ms. Alina, or oh, oh, Mr. Shah, I see that you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think uh, it's actually it's, it's important to, of course, to, uh, to practice their own language, my, my, my own language, I think. It's another thing, how, how are we going to communicate that? And we need uh, to provide a platform for, for indigenous people, especially the safe platform that they can just voice easily about their uh, concern about the environment issue around their uh, com uh, community area. And that's another thing we, we need to provide for Malaysia because Malaysia now still, we still have uh, dealing with the authority, well, you know, almost like silent your, your voice. And, and maybe we find a better space for indigenous people to speak because uh, so much so much issue around Malaysia now that I think uh, the trouble that that uh, that they they face is they uh, they're afraid they will affect their their their, uh, their their daily job because if you try to voice about the issue they will um, the the authority will suddenly will just try to um, silence them and also try to trade them because this happened in many times before and how we gonna go forward and how we gonna uh, allow the indigenous people not to be afraid to to voice the issue because this is concern to everybody because we don't have a space for indigenous people we don't know how, what happened in our in, 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 in our backyard and uh, mm -hmm. Of course, we know that indigenous people are frontline in protecting uh, our forests from being uh, destroyed, and we need to let them to to allow to talk freely without feel, uh, you know, uh, without feel uh, afraid that they will say some something that you know <laughs> will make them lose their job. I think that's another thing that's most important thing, and the language it, it, of course. Everybody freely to communicate any language they want, and so I think I think it's a, it's a everybody should have a freedom to express anything they want in their, their language. And at, for us, I think for everybody need to give them space. And then if they have language issue, then we probably take some uh, uh, initiative by translate that into English or something something that really. Example that uh, one one NGO called uh, Rimau NGO. They managed to uh, get a funding to uh, help uh, to train the indigenous people of Jahai in in Broibulum to protect the tiger in a in a uh, in a, in a forest. There. I think that's a very good example. Maybe we do we need to do something similar to indigenous people in Malaysia. It actually help them to have an income and also help them help they will help us to protect jungle for us. I think that's another thing we need to, to look for. I think it will be win-win in any situation. And that's, uh, it, I, 
if you if you're interested in the uh, the 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 initiative run by the uh, state uh, 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 sorry uh, Para State Forestry and also uh, a Rimau NGO, you can go to at at IMAU NGO. I think it, you can find it in the in the Google. They have fantastic story. The how how the the that kind of story actually uh, uh, inspire other community in in Kelantan now. They they they, they went to the uh, 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 like a train uh, like a training center to learn how to be a ranger for the for the forest to protect the forest and also uh, give them give them the, the knowledge. Uh, the knowledge to the to the uh, uh, our 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 future. I think mm, definitely. I like your answer, Mr. Shack. All right. So moving on to the next question from Jiva. Um, in your opinion, do you think the public have enough access to resources that can educate them towards practicing climate change mitigation strategies? And how do you think the practice can be widely encouraged as part of their lifestyle changes? I think this is more directed towards Ms. Yeah. Elena, this climate change mitigation. Yeah. So thank you, Jiva, for the question. Um, I think uh, in our personal opinion, uh, as a company, the public does not have enough access to the resources on climate change right now. Not to say just the public, even we don't have enough access to resources. <laughs> The problem with developing countries is the lack of data. That one is a huge problem. If you try to look for data, you can't find it because you know it could be in one institute, it could be at another jabatan or another agency, it's just everywhere. Uh, so I think not just the public don't have resource, uh, access to resources, we also don't have access to resources. Um, but I think... Um, Whatever is available on public domain, uh, that is something that you know. Uh, it, it takes the willpower lah for people to actually look and search for this kind of resources and data. Uh, you know, you've got only got twenty four hours in a day. You know, minus eight hours of sleep, two hours traffic jam, time with the kids. You know, work some more. So whatever limited time that you have, you know, you would need to have the willpower to actually search for climate change, uh, you know. So, um, I think um, the item that is important is that the trigger point. Uh, so, if people are aware that, you know, uh, they uh, cycle or they go jogging at their usual river trail, for example, then they can see the river is dirty. Uh, you know, they send the kids to school and then after that, they see how come got flash flood last night. Uh, there must be a problem with that parade or that longkang or whatever, right? So I think um, the trigger points will only be uh, forthcoming to those who actually alert to these trigger points. Uh, but at the same time, um, what do you call this? Uh, any national communication channel uh, would be the area that uh, you know the government has to educate the people. Uh, some people still watch TV1, RTM. Uh, so this is where the documentaries are there to talk about climate change, to talk about the uh, technologies, the solutions, what you can do as a public. Uh, so I think um, uh, a lot of people play roles in this. So for example, like uh, when we talk to cities, right? Cities have a role. Uh, if say, for example, they have like a Saturday morning workshop, for example, uh, they create awareness about recycling. Uh, that one is something that the practice can be encouraged as the lifestyle for the people. Uh, because uh, typically Malaysians, we love gatherings, Every, especially <laughs> gatherings that got food, you know, free food. So use this as the carrot, but the topic will be how to recycle, how to do composting. Uh, so I think uh, if a lot more parties, a lot more people use these avenues to create awareness, uh, like what Econites is doing today, it's a great job. Uh, I think that uh, if you can talk to one person and influence that one person to change their lifestyle, you've already you know hit a benchmark where you know awareness can be done lah. So I think um, it's just number one being alert, being aware of the situation, what's happening around you. Flash floods, no sun for two weeks, your clothes are not dry, uh, raining nonstop, the uh, thunder is just like on top of your roof. These are all climate change. These are all radical weather changes that's happening due to decades of climate change effect. Uh, so I think the just the awareness, uh, just a little bit awareness that trigger people to find more information, whatever that's available on public domain or TV, and then just having that willpower to join more activities that's related that will then trigger the lifestyle changes. Yeah. Mm, yes, thank you, Ms. Alina. Yes, 
for you who are listening today, you know what you can do. Um, be alert, talk to one person. It could be your family members. It could be your friends and influence that person to change their lifestyle. All right. Um, I think we'll take one more last question. I'll direct this to Ms. Shakila. Uh, this question is from Celine. So she's asking, could you share some of your communication tips that can enhance public awareness? And additionally, what is your take on incorporating youth-focused citizen science programs to address environmental issues in Malaysia? So two questions there. Okay, thank you, Celine, for that. <laughs> so I really love that question because I'm a, my, a communication student. And when I talk about, um, and first year, when I talk about uh, environmental, uh, 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 about science and environmental and everything, I get a lot of backlash because I don't even know exactly what that means and everything. So the communication, uh, science communication is very important. This is what we, uh, we will, um, you will learn in LASA uh, to be like, or uh, me as a communication student, I have to break this, uh, I mean, like big, big words, like, uh, climate change, like uh, carbon, carbon emission and everything. I have to break these big, big words to be um, like everyone have to, to understand this, this term. Like if, if you think uh, you, you in science background know about this, not everyone know that. Uh, our, our grassroots don't even, even have to imagine what is carbon emission, what is this, what is that. So my, my job is uh, as as communication person, I have to break this term to be like easier to them to, to understand. And I think this is like uh, sometimes when, when we talk uh, to, to other person, uh, to other people around our community, why they don't listen to us? Because sometimes they don't even understand what we, we try to say, what we try to emphasize to them. So we have to find another way to, to small that, uh, to, to break that, that term. Like, okay, uh, what we do to our community is actually when we, we saw like the, the community is, they have a lot of housewives. So we go to them and the, the science communication is here is like, uh, we, we ask them uh, the price of fish in the market, the, the price of uh, chicken in the market, the price of vegetables in the market. And they will start complaining that they said the, the prices are going up, the, the, the prices are increasing uh, drastically and everything. So. Uh, slowly, we talk to them. Oh, did you know this is uh, all about climate change? This is like why why your fish uh, why the price of fishes going uh, very very high these days? Because we don't have enough resources. Uh, why these chickens get uh, the, the the prices is increasing um, like very very much and everything. So not everyone you have to talk about the science term. You have to go to their level or you have to go to their, uh, their surrounding or their environment. So if they have a lot of uh, fishermen, you have to, to ask, Pakcik, banyak tangkapan today? Or like, uh, is, it, is it easy to catch fish to, uh, nowadays? And they, they start to tell you, oh, this is like, uh, they have pembangunan over there. We, we have lost our knee and everything. This is like, for me, it's uh, also a science communication. And some, uh, if you want to see more of my video on advocacy, you can go to Amal Studios. And I, I did uh, talk a lot about, um, about nature, about uh, not, not much about climate change because more of the concern is about our uh, forest. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I do talk about more about forest and I break down these big, big words of science to be uh, like everyone will, will understand what we, we bring or what we have uh, done in in past a uh, few years so when you when you go to some community some some communities in urban communities itself sometimes they don't even understand what is climate change what is this what is that so you have to find a right words to tackle a right community for me yeah is it is it uh, menjawab <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much miss shakira uh, so that concludes our Q&A session and we're coming to the end of our dialogue for today. So let's just go around the table once more. Um, speakers, do you have any final remarks, final call to action for our participants? Yes, Mr. Shaq, always the first to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I'd like to address the NAUs out there and you know, whatever you do, it will 
you know, it will affect uh, in the future. And then make sure you be uh, responsible. Sometimes being responsible is cool as well, you know? <laughs> and it, it's uh, like I said, um, let's fight this for our livable future. Let's fight this together. This is not just for us, for me, for our, our youth leader, but actually for everybody around the world. Let's fight for our livable future. Mm, indeed. Miss Alina? Yeah. Hi, Shaq uh, took my word <laughs> out of my mouth. <laughs> my message is uh, keep on fighting for the planet and the earth. Uh, keep on joining the efforts. Don't give up. Uh, if you can't find the venue, find somebody that can help you to the venue of the event or the initiative. Uh, never give up in helping us create awareness to the society. You are our young generation, our youth leaders. Uh, never give up. Uh, being young, uh, that tripping and falling and getting up, uh, it's very important. Be our uh, vocal courts, be our vocal <laughs> box uh, to champion this awareness and be eco-warriors. Yeah, that one is my last message. Mm. You guys are vocalists, so use your voice, people. All right, uh, Miss Shakila, anything to add? All right, last but not least, is actually, uh, um, I think when you, you go with a youth uh, or youth leader in climate advocacy, you will be backlash, you will be, uh, everyone will sometimes, they, they don't even have the, the knowledge about this, so they think this is like something new, something like fake and everything. So you will get everything like backlash and everything. So I, the, the advice for you uh, is to be strong. If you know the fact about that uh, certain issues or that uh, topic, stay on your ground, uh, fight for your right. And if you get uh, in intimidation from, from uh, others, just go to your friends or get help from, from others so that uh, you, you will not drain and everything. So. I guess if you if you know about uh, the, the the topic or the, the issues, uh, if if you talk about your your kampung issues and everything, and you know exactly what happening there, and everyone talk uh, talk back to you or they they just uh, said like something, this is like fake news and everything. Uh, just stay on your ground and please fight for for your own sake, for your own community and everything. So we need uh, youth who brave to, to face this, this thing, because we will face uh, many more challenges. Is it from, uh, from our own community, our own friends and everything? If you know that you, you said or, or you stated the fact, just go with it, just fight if you, uh, until you find the, the, the thing to, to, to achieve. Yeah, that's it for me. All right, thank you so much to all the speakers. And um, please don't leave yet, vocalists. Um, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, so great news to all vocalists. Project Vocal will have a mentorship program in May. So calling for all youth groups in Malaysia who are working on projects tackling climate-related issues to submit their project pitch to Project Vocal. So they will have the ambassadors and advisors as a youth committee guiding and working together with these groups. And there's also opportunities for seed fund grants. So, you know, use your voice, vocalists, and stay tuned on your social media and newsletter for this opportunity. And... Finally, the moment that we've all been waiting for, um, photo time. So please turn on your cameras so that we can all have a group photo together. Yeah. And put on your nicest smile. This will go on um, Project Vocal's Instagram. Are you all ready? Yeah. <laughs> Always ready, uh, Mr. Shark. <laughs> <laughs> yes, smile, everyone. Put on your nicest smile. Um, are you, uh, Eco Nights, right? Um, done taking the picture. Okay. One, two, one. All right. Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. 
Um, don't forget to follow Project Vocal on your Instagram and Twitter for the latest news and updates. And stay tuned because they will have lots of upcoming programs in the future. Thank you to all the speakers, all the participants, and of course, um, GEF as GP of UNDP for funding this project and making it possible. Um, Salamat berbuka puasa for all those who are fasting. I hope you all had a good time and learned a lot. And who knows, maybe I'll see you all in the next session. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank you for inviting us as speakers as well. And thank you to all the participants. Selamat berbuka. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Miss Elena, Shakoyo, Ashley, and everyone here. Selamat berbuka. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ikonite. Selamat Hope you all had a good time. <laughs>